Colored glass has always fascinated me. It's a very beautiful material. Unfortunately, it's not that easy to work with. Unlike wood, it does not forgive mistakes. And because I don't have the right furnaces, and because of the risk of fire, I can't easily improvise glass blowing in my own workshop. But a stained glass window, like in a Gothic cathedral, would also be nice, I thought to myself, and spontaneously promised my wife to make one for our living room. But the whole thing was much more difficult than expected. Studying medieval art was the easiest thing. The Ulmo Münster, one of the most beautiful Gothic cathedrals in Germany, is very close to us. Inside the colored light from the windows is particularly beautiful on sunny days. But very few windows here have survived the Second World War. It was a miracle anyway that the cathedral was only hit by a few bombs and did not collapse. The windows in the southern ale here are modern, but are partly based on the design of medieval windows. Others are of a very modern design. Here in the Trier we find medieval windows. They survived because they had been removed during the war. From here a small passageway leads to the private chapel of the old patrician family named Bessero. The most important medieval glass windows in southern Germany can be found here. Even as a child I particularly liked this depiction of Noah's Ark. And the Holy Family here. The glasses are held together by lead strips, the so-called canes. The aim was to combine glasses of different colors, but also to be able to create larger areas of glass. In the Middle Ages, panes of glass could only be made by cutting open blown glass cylinders, which limited their size. However, the canes are usually formed in such a way that they also have design functions. Paintings were applied to the glass field, which gave the motifs more details. Now I had to find the right materials and tools. Glass, canes, an improvised crumb tongue and a glass cutter. The beautiful, typical lead knife here is a gift from a friend who is a master glazier. Then the design had to be made. I wanted to show the beautiful Ulm city view from the Danube with the Ulmer Münster, the old town and a traditional ship traveling on the Danube. The first sketch then had to be translated into the language of glass and canes. Not every line is feasible and you have to make sure the layout is somehow balanced. And for reasons of stability, a certain bond, as with masonry, is necessary. The choice of glasses was not easy. Some of which I bought looked different than I thought they would or didn't go well with the other colors. In my exuberant joy when buying glass I got very different surface structures from smooth to heavily structured. I had to make a reasonably harmonious selection here. As a surface for working it makes sense not to take the tabletop itself but to put a board onto it. I screwed two edge strips to this which were exactly at a right angle in order to have a guide for two sides of the window. For the transfer of the design to the glass cuts, I thought at first that I could simply leave the drawing underneath and transfer the lines to the glass panes placed on top. I started at the bottom of the window with the beautiful blue glasses for the Danube. After cutting the first pieces of glass, however, I quickly realized that this was becoming too imprecise. Following a line Freehand with the glass cutter is not easy. At first I tried to compensate for the cutting errors in the field that follows. But that gets pretty tedious in the long run. So I copied the drawing onto a thicker paper, numbered the glass parts and then cut them out individually. It was important to cut away the narrow spaces that are necessary for the course of the cames. I simply used the thickness of the felt tip pen as a measure of these gaps. 
with these templates, it was much easier to cut out the glass parts correctly. In fact, it works quite well if you put the glass cutter on the edge of the paper and guide it along it. The lead cames must be placed one inside of the other at the joints. To do this, the lead must be widened on the continuous profiles, but slightly compressed on the adjacent ones. This is typically done with the lead knife handle. However, the profile usually has to be cleaned up a bit afterwards, so that the glass still fits in it. When the came has been pushed into the other profile, the excess can be cut off at the edge of the glass. It is already slightly tapered by that for the next joint. You can taper it further with the lead knife underneath. The parts which are still loosely plugged into each other are temporarily held in place with small nails. Fortunately, over time I had some practice and that was indeed necessary when I got to the area of the city and the Minster, because it became much more difficult to guide the cames properly there. Here I'm making the roof of the butcher's tower. If you notice that it is slightly slanted, this tower of the old city fortification is actually leaning to one side. I wanted to use a different technique for the Ulmer Münster. Its color and its structure should be represented by painting alone. So I used clear glass and painted on it with glass paint. I couldn't make it too detailed or it wouldn't have matched the rest of the window. Of course, real glass painting cannot be done with this hobbyist paint, but with paints that are baked at high temperatures. But I didn't have the right oven for that. Eventually everything was put together. The last glasses in the sky area had been large and easy to set. However, I had to shorten them by 5 mm at the top. Apparently I had left more gaps than planned when working upwards. Then came the U-profiles on the edges. The side that is now on top will usually be the inside of the glazing. If everything fits, the cames are pressed down onto the glass with a piece of wood. Then all joints of the cames are soldered together. Some soldering water has to be used, otherwise it won't work. You have to use lead tin solder with 40% tin and 60% lead because that has the lowest melting point and you don't want to melt the lead cames. Of course, an electronic soldering iron is not suitable here, you need something stronger. I have several historical soldering irons lying around that I have never used before. Now they were just right. When heated with a gas torch, such a massive soldering iron stores the heat for a while. Now the window had to be flipped. This is best done with a board on top, because you can't yet lift the window in two hands. Without soldering on the outside, it's too unstable. So the first thing to do is the soldering on the outside. The window has about 100 solar points and 54 panes of glass. After that, I didn't press down the cames straight away, but put some putty in the gap. I tried ready-to-use putty first, but it was too tough. I diluted it with linseed oil, then it worked well. I ended up working with my fingers. Now it was time to press down the edges of the canes. In the end you have a mess on the glazing that you have to remove somehow. 
The easiest way is to throw on a good portion of sawdust and rub down the window bit by bit. At the same time, you rub the lead rods nicely and uniformly bright. A little bit of woodwork was needed before installation. The intended opening is between the living room and the staircase. There was still a wooden frame and a decorative panel to attach. The glazing was dimensioned in such a way that it fit neatly into a rabbit. An exciting moment then, the installation. Luckily everything was just right. Then I screwed the frame around it and the thing was done. If the glazing is not illuminated from the other side, it does not look too spectacular. But if the lighting situation is right, the impression is indeed something special. It was a lot of work, but it was fun. And what I learned above all is that this type of glass craftsmanship requires many years of practice if you want to do it perfectly. <laughs>